with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. Um, we are going to be visiting chapter 17 um, see now I've got to count pardon me this month and the first week of August there's just a lot here that I thought we needed to cover in Genesis 17. We're going to do quite a bit of review, but we're going to bring some other aspects into that as well. Genesis 17, really we're looking at the first part of the, well, the first three-fourths of verse 1. And Moses writes, Now when Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. I am God Almighty. As we approach the text this morning, uh, Abram has been on quite the journey, and we with him. I, at least I think we have. I have. I hope you have too. In chapter 12, he was called by God to leave everything he knew for something God would show him, right? He would leave his country and his relatives and his father's house to obtain a land, a nation, and a great name. But more than that, it is not just that. It is that, but it is something else as well. He would receive the blessing of God and become a vessel through which the blessing of God comes to others. Now isn't that uh, something to aspire to? Not to be an end in itself, to receive God's blessing and make it stop there, but the blessing of God is of such a nature that it would come through you into the lives of others. And even greater still concerning Abram, it would be in Abram, that is, in his seed, that the families of the earth would be blessed. And that's quite a testimony as well. Uh, that is good news, because the families of the earth uh, had not been blessed. The families of the earth uh, had demonstrated time and time again that in itself, that is, in humanity itself, it could not arrive at the answer that it needed. It had nothing in itself, no resources in itself to achieve deliverance, to achieve God's blessing or favor upon them. And so this is a great promise. This is a fantastic, gloriously, wonderful promise. The superlatives that you could use would fall short of what God is doing uh, in this passage, in that phrase. The problem, the problem that is encountered here is that the woman has been become unproductive in Sarai as she was barren. Uh, that's sort of the repeated phrase, right? Refrain, and Sarah was barren, and they had no children. And yet the promise of God persists. Well, then Abram ventures throughout the land, and he ends up in Egypt. And there God thwarts the uh, purposes of Pharaoh, the seed of the serpent, and instead curses Pharaoh and blesses Abram. With that blessing comes strife between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot. Remember that. Abram, having been the recipient of the promise of God, gives first choice to Lot. And Lot chooses the valley of the Jordan and Abram remains in the land. Instead of going to the right or left, as Abram suggested, that is north or south, 
Lot uh, went east. He goes east. There's a war that breaks out then between the two sets of kings from the east and in the, in the Jordan Valley, Sodom, Gomorrah, and others. And Lot is taken captive. Abram rescues Lot, returns the goods to the other kings, and he meets Melchizedek, priest of God Most High. He takes nothing from the king of Sodom. He says, I won't be enriched by you. And in fact, Abram only does it because of his nephew, right? The blessing of God comes to Abram, which then flows to Lot. Then God appears to Abram in a vision and cuts a covenant with him. On the heels of the assurance of God in the making of this covenant, Sarai is still barren. So she gives her Egyptian servant to Abram to have children through her. The plan backfires for Hagar refuses to go through with her side of the bargain. She decides this child is mine and I'm going to keep him. Abram at that time was 85 when he was alerted to things, and then 86 when uh, Ishmael was born. Now we come, uh, we come to the setting for today. We have now been with Abram for 24 years, as the text says, that he is 99 years old. Did I do my math right? 99 minus 75? 24 years. And again, I think we have this idea that God was constantly speaking to or revealing himself to the saints of old. But such was not the case. The last time that God had appeared to Abram, he was less than 85 years of age, or about 85. So at this point in time, it had been at least 14 years. 14 years since the Lord spoke to Abram and revealed himself in any significant way at all whatsoever. Can you imagine? I don't know if Abram had written down anything, but he had the assurances of God in previous appearances. And he had the altars that he had built in calling upon the name of the Lord. But it had been 14 years. And within the last 20, or within, and within the 24 years that Abram had been in the land counting his call, the Lord had appeared to Abram three previous times. It's not a lot for 24 years. So when God speaks in furthering revelation, it is important that we listen to what he has to say. This is true whenever God speaks, whether it's a few words or many. What is important to note, though, is that when God speaks in a major way, redemptive history is being advanced. Something is going on. God is enlarging something. So the text says very clearly for today, in 17.1, that the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. What does the name mean? To begin with, the word El is translated God and Shaddai is translated Almighty. The word Almighty is derived from the Septuagint, which uses the word that means all-powerful. The writers, the translators for the, for the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, decided that all-powerful was the best word. The Latin Vulgate translates the word which in the English means omnipotent, omnipotent. There are some who trace the Hebrew word to a root meaning to be strong or powerful. A rabbinic analysis says that this word is a compound word meaning one who is enough or the one who is sufficient or self-sufficient. In more recent times, two other suggestions have been put forth. One is that the word is to be connected with the Hebrew verb meaning to destroy, thus El Shaddai, God my destroyer. 
The second option is that the word is connected to an Akkadian word meaning mountain. And so when used in combination, El Shaddai would translate into the English something like God of the mountain. God of the mountain. That is, it is in reference to God's abode. That in itself would be a good study of the mountains. You may think, well, the mountains. Well, everything that God does has been on a mountain, right? Even Jesus, the sermon on the mount, right? Yeah, law giving from the mountain, revealing himself from the mountain, and so on. We think of it as his abode, that is where he reveals himself here on earth very often. The effect of the meaning concerning mountain is that it instills confidence in the person of faith. Confidence. I mean, you look up at the mountains, right? You think, man, they are something. So it is to the Lord of the hills or of the mountain that the saints of old looked in confidence that God will do as he says he will do. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. What has Abram, we want to look at what Abram has learned, what we have learned about God to this point. At the start of this project, we learned that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. To say that God is the creator is to say that God brought forth the material of the universe, seen and unseen, out of nothing, right? So scientists banter back and forth about whether there was something rather than nothing and why is there something rather than nothing and all of these things. Philosophers throw in their two cents. We look at the scriptures and this is what it presents to us. God is the creator and he didn't need material. He brought it forth. He brought it forth. Everything seen and unseen and throughout the first week he fashioned it together. To say that God is the creator of all things, then, is to say that God is the sustainer of all things. Sustainer of all things. What he has created, he sustains. And we learn that as creator, our God does all things well. God looked over everything and he said, it is very good. He does all things well. The Lord from time to time enters into evaluation of some aspect of creation and at the end of the creation week, it is very good. To say that God is creator and sustainer is to say that God is intimately involved with creation, right? Intimately involved. He is not the deistic God who created all things and is now absent from all things. No, our God is the creator and sustainer of all things and is involved in all things. There is no strictly natural law then, at least in my opinion, as if God is not needed. If you think natural law means that God is not needed, then you have a wrong idea of what's going on. Because he upholds all things... What does the writer of the Hebrew say? By the word of his power. He sustains it all. He holds it all together. In Christ all things consist and are held together. He sustains it all. And he is sustaining sustaining his creation even now. He is very much Lord of all and he is sovereign over all. In planting the Garden of Eden, we find that our God provides abundantly for humanity. He gives him a perfect environment in which to thrive and prosper and accomplish his will. He is to to subdue right around him. He is to subdue and take dominion of creation. Today, I don't mean to get in trouble, of course I tread where we tend to think we should not take dominion. We tend to think as humanity, no, we shouldn't subdue all things. It's a different worldview. It's a different idea of how we approach the things around us. Oh, we got to be careful. And we think we're God. And we set ourselves up as if we think we can control all things. 
That's idolatry. We learn then after the fall that our God is indeed compassionate, merciful, gracious, patient, abounding in loving kindness and truth. We learned a very needed lesson that our God forgives our sin, iniquity, and transgression. But we also learn that our God is a just God, and thus he enters into evaluation and judgment. Since it's his creation, he is able, and we are his creatures, he is able to do that. He is able to visit us and evaluate us and enter into judgment periodically. He is the righteous judge who does all things well. And so he was a just judge in bringing forth his judgments in the aftermath of the fall and the flood and against humanity at Babel. However, during these periods of judgments, we learned that our God is our redeemer as well. It isn't just being a judge and taking on his judgment. No, it is about redemption. It is about regaining a relationship with the living and true God because he is compassionate and merciful and gracious, right? We first learned this in Genesis 3.15 where Moses writes, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The second time we learn that our God is our Redeemer is in his saving humanity by instructing Noah to build an ark. This ark would hold every representative creature within which is the breath of life. The face of the earth would be renewed and humanity would have a fresh start. We often talk about needing a fresh start and thinking, boy, the next time we would get it right. Well, we didn't get it right. And we talk this way about going to the moon or Mars and colonization and then we'll get it right. But if any human being goes there, we will get it wrong. We won't get it right. And we need to acknowledge that. This points up an important truth for us. Our God saves the redeemed through judgment. Through judgment. Those who entered the ark were redeemed, were kept safe, right? For us, death seems so final. We're cut off, right? I, I, and, it, and it weighs on us. I can no longer speak with my mom and dad. I can no longer have that interaction that I long to have with someone else because of death, and it seems... It seems so final. The atheistic materialist says it is final. It is final. They're returning back to stardust. I mean, that's where they say you came from, the stardust, basically. So that's where you're returning to. But God says it is not final. It is not final. Death does not have the last word. It may be the last enemy, A great enemy, but it is not final. Who are we to believe? The atheistic materialist or God? The Lord is the one in whom is our trust and hope. It is not found in human wisdom or supposition, but in the Lord. That is the great hope, isn't it? Not even death can hold him, therefore it cannot hold us. God Almighty is able to save and deliver even in the face of great judgment. He did so for Noah and his family, and he will do so for those who trust in the Lord Jesus. And so God, who is the Redeemer, brings forth the promise of redemption in the seed of the woman and now in the seed of Abram. That promise that all the families of the earth being blessed in Abram is the good news. Paul calls that the good news. That's the gospel. That's the blessing of God coming to the nations. 
It is the good news of salvation to those who had fallen away from the Lord and rebelled against him. Well, God is also known as a shield. He protected Abram in the battle with the kings and rescuing Lot. It is God who delivers your enemies into your hand. At the same time, we learn of God Most High, who is possessor of heaven and earth. As such, he is the one who grants inheritance to the families of the earth. But not only that, what the Lord gives as an inheritance, he may take away and give to another. It's July 4th. I fear that for our country. We don't have an inherent right, but it is in God's graciousness that he gives us this land. We need to remember that. So God is a shield to Abram to protect him as the Lord brings his promise to fruition. The Lord is also the one who cuts a covenant with Abram. He does so to assure Abram that what he has promised he will bring to fruition. God promises Abram by essentially laying his own name on the line. He says, in effect, may it be done so to me as these sacrifices, that is, Abraham, remember, cuts the animals in half and lays them each side by side with a path down the middle. So God is saying, in essence, may it be done to me as these sacrifices if I do not fulfill my word to you. And then the Lord reveals himself as the one who sees. That is, he sees the affliction of his people. He saw the affliction of Hagar and responded accordingly. However, Abram and Sarai know the affliction of being childless. God will see their situation and he will respond. And the children of Israel cry out in their affliction and the Lord takes heed to it because he sees them and what they are enduring. And now God introduces himself as El Shaddai, God Almighty. If it had to do with being God of the mountain, what might be said? When you think of a mountain, what comes to mind other than I'd rather not drive over it? Although I did, but (laughs) majesty, exaltation, power, (laughs) dread, steadfastness, immovability, strength, confidence. Look at what the psalmist says in Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Make special notice here of what the psalmist does. He looks up to the mountains. He looks up to the mountains. But he does so from a position not of admiration of it, per se, but of needing help, of needing help. So he looks up to the mountains. It's as if he's saying, I will purposefully look up at the mountains because I need help. And there I find my answer to my question, from where will my help come? It comes from the Lord who is the God of the mountain. What do you need and how will it come about? What do you need and how will it come about? That is the issue for us as human beings. We tend to think in the temporal only. Well, I need food and I need drink and I need clothing and covering. What do you need fundamentally, you see? What does your neighbor need fundamentally that gives expression in these other ways? And what answer do you have for them? Do you point them to the God of the mountain? From from where will my help come? The mountain remains firm and steadfast. The mountain is immovable. 
By all practical appearances, it remains and will never be removed. I mean, that's how it appears to us, right? And when one looks up at the mountains and sees how grand and majestic they really are, it instills within oneself a sense of greater confidence in the God of the mountain who is able to do all his holy will. Now the text makes specific mention of Abram's age. She was 99 years old. The scriptures don't mention his age just for the sake of mentioning his age. The scriptures are also clear that Abram entered the land at 75 years of age. He was given the promise of seed and land. He was told that in him the families of the earth would be blessed. This answers the question of what is to be done to rescue the families as they disperse from the city they sought to build called Babel, for they had rebelled against the living and true God and sought to make a name for themselves. What is to be done? How are we to receive our help? Now keep thinking about his age. How long had he been in the land? 24 years. What did he have to show for it? What did he have to show for it for in 24 years? Think about it. What did Abram have to show for 24 years of being in the land, setting up altars, calling on the name of the Lord? And the answer is absolutely nothing, eh? So it's sort of a question and an exclamation point, right? Absolutely nothing, someone might say. But that is not quite the case, is it? What do you mean, Pastor? He was promised both land and seed, and he hadn't received anything yet. To what are you referring? I'm glad you asked. He did receive something. What had he received up to this point? He had received the Lord himself. He had received the Lord himself. He had the living and true God revealing himself in various ways to encourage him through, throughout this process. So when Abram needed it, the Lord revealed himself as the one who blesses. When he needed it, he revealed himself as the one who protects. So, listen carefully here, see, because God is at work in you doing these things, so the same question can be asked of you. When your neighbor needed it, were you there to bless? When your neighbor needed it, did you stand up to defend them, to protect them? When, the Lord, when he needed it, the Lord revealed himself as the one who is a shield. Have you been a shield to someone? You see, the blessing of God comes to you and then through you to your neighbor. When he needed it, he revealed himself as the one who sees your affliction. Have you seen the affliction of your neighbor? Your, the trouble they're in. When we say sees, of course we mean he takes heed to it. He understands. But not only that, he acts on behalf of the one who is afflicted. And now when Abram needs it, God Most High reveals himself as El Shaddai. As we wrap up our thoughts for today, where does all of this leave us? One, it leaves us with the fullness of the revelation of God himself. And what do I mean by that? It means that our God has left us with his word in which is revealed everything we need to know about him right here in the pages of this word. Not in encyclopedic form, I've said before. If that were the case, you know, this sanctuary couldn't contain all the volumes. Remember Peter? It's been a while. 
He says the Lord gives us everything we need for life and godliness. What does that encompass? Well, everything about your life and everything about being godly in this life. All the resources necessary. Everything about it. It leaves us with a reservoir of knowledge, the likes of which we will never plumb the depths. We're trying. We're digging. We continue. God chooses to disclose himself to us. He is gracious in that way. That is, specially through his word. Through his word, he unpacks who he is as God and how he interacts with his creation. He reveals his ways to us. And he is able to demonstrate those ways to us throughout redemptive history as he unfolds it for us. So remember, Abram wasn't that far along in redemptive history. I mean, here, Abraham, the rest of redemptive history, right? He wasn't that far along in it. There wasn't as much revealed to him as there is to us, but, but this is key. If you forget everything else, this is something you need to latch on to. There was always enough in whatever stage humanity was found. Always enough. There is never a point in time in human history where a group of humans could stand before God at the judgment seat and say, in our era of existence, you just didn't give us enough. It won't work. Because that's not true. He has always given us, he's always given humanity enough for life and godliness at whatever stage of development as we look back. Knowing this, secondly, do you know him? Have you called upon the name of the Lord to deliver you from your sins? Remember, he is compassionate and merciful and gracious and patient and abounding in loving kindness and truth, forgiving our sin, iniquity, and transgression. That's why we call upon his name. Remember, we call upon the name of the Lord because of a desire to act on behalf of or remember his people. Lord, it seems like your people are losing. What's going on? Help. It's not very complicated. We call upon the name of the Lord in remembrance of his character. Lord, this situation in which I find myself seems incongruent with who you are as God. Help me see. Help me understand. And we call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, which is itself a continuum from the temporal to the spiritual or eternal. And this is the point we are talking about here. Again, remember, God is compassionate and merciful, gracious, patient. This doesn't encompass everything, but it's a good start. Abounding in loving kindness and truth and forgiving sin, iniquity, and transgression. To whom else is there to appeal? When someone cries out that you see saying, where is the answer? Neon lights flashing. This is it. Step up and bless this person. By pointing to the name of God. By pointing to Jesus Christ. Not in a superiority kind of attitude, but one of humble boldness that says, I was dead in my sin and transgression and the Lord saved me and he delivered me and he can deliver you. He's the final, really, appeal there is. 
Now being reminded of this, do you know him? We're talking about a relationship. And although we need to know facts about God, it is not just facts that we are talking about. We are speaking about a practical relational knowledge of our Lord. In other words, have you considered the name of God for your life? How that makes itself, how that works itself out in your life. And let me give you one example. Have you experienced God's compassion? Every one of us <coughs> has to answer in the affirmative, of course. Yes. Have you demonstrated or lived out that compassion in your own life toward others? Think again about the kind of person you are, not what other people say about how great you are. Oh, so-and-so, oh, she's really great. She's the best person in the world. And you're humbled by that in two ways. One, because of a testimony before the Lord, but in another way, you know yourself well enough that there is nothing good to say about you apart from God's grace and mercy. That's a humbling experience. And understanding again that how God has been so patient with you, how can you not be that patient with others? How compassionate God has been with you, how can you not be that way with others? And have you experienced the various ways in which God reveals himself in your life in his compassion and mercy and grace and so on? I trust that you have. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, for the abundance of your grace that flows through the word and it is applied to our lives through uh, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Lord, we, we simply give you thanks. We bow before you, the Lord of glory. And we give thanks and praise to you. For without you and without abiding in the vine, there is no hope. There is no help. But instead, like the psalmist and like Abram, we may look to the mountain. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. Lord, may that message resonate in our lives from now till eternity. And we'll give you the glory and praise through Christ. Amen.